going to get things started. I am, my name is Laura McBain, and I am already getting distracted by the chat already this morning with all the folks dropping in already and saying hi from around the country and around the globe. Uh, my name is Laura McBain, and I am the co-director of the K-12 Lab, and I am just so honored to see over 111 and probably even more coming in from all over the country um, to join us today of educators from around the country who are really thinking about um, how we serve and we bring innovation into our communities and how we bring creativity as part of our daily life and practice. And so I will share a little bit, um, just a little bit of a framing and then I'm gonna kick it off to my dear colleague, uh, Jeremy Ellie from our executive education team. But I just wanna let you know, we've got a whole crew of folks from San Diego, as well as folks from all over the country that are coming together um, and our D-School team here, uh, Jao and Catherine and a number of us here as your support team here. So I just wanna frame up a little bit is that one thing we've been thinking a lot about at the D-School is how we really inculcate creativity into our daily lives. How do we actually become practicer, practicers and experts and bringing creativity, not just into our classrooms, but into the rituals that we design with ourselves, with our communities, with our young people, and with the adults that we're serving. And so this entire series is actually something that Jeremy and the exact edu education team at the D-School have been training thousands of educators and innovation and creativity experts around the globe and we started bringing these conversations together like all of us do, what would it look like if we brought these, these ideas around input, parallel prototyping, practices for bringing sneaky uh, experiments into our practices, how do we actually bring that together into K-12? And so today, this is one of those great examples what we call radical collaboration that we practice at the D-School, where we have folks from industry, education and other sectors coming together to think about how we bring more creative practices into our daily lives. And I know if you're anyone like me, uh, and we've been on Zoom over the last two years, is that we need more creativity in our lives, is that the problems that we face in our country and the challenges that are facing our young people need creative folks like yourselves, like all of us, who are bringing a strong lens of equity a strong practice of creativity and a strong commitment to making education something that's worth inspiring, right? That's worth helping young people thrive. And so this series, as well as the others that follow, um, will be experiences where you all get to dive in and work alongside of our team from our executive education team, as well as others within the um, K-12 sphere to think about how they're bringing creativity into the practices the lessons, the systems that we design within K-12 education and beyond. And so as you go through this series today and potentially others, you're gonna meet people from different sectors, from education, potentially from others, and think about how we are constantly thinking of ourselves as creative practitioners, right? Thinking of ourselves as designers, people that have the creative courage to take on wicked challenges and show up with a lens toward equity so that we can actually design the systems that we know our young people deserve um, as they go into the future. So I'm gonna stop chatting and I'm excited to see the chat is going off with folks from Russia, from India, and I'm gonna kick it to my dear colleague, Jeremy Utley, who's gonna walk us through our very first session and share a little bit more about this entire series. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks, Laura. And it's so amazing to see everybody here today. It's so humbling. Um, feel free to turn on your video if you want to, if you're able to. We'd love to see your faces. No pressure, obviously, if you're in a spot where you can't, but it's fun to see your faces and say hello. That's one of the benefits of this. That's why it's not a YouTube live event. We get actual interaction. We can, I can see your chats and be distracted by your chats. It's great. It's super fun. It's super cool to see so many folks that we've gotten to know over the years joining in and to meet a bunch of uh, new collaborators. As Laura mentioned, I'm a part of the executive education team, and we conceived of this series originally just as a, a little way of uh, sharing some knowledge that we were creating with the world. Um, we run really, really big programs at the D school, and that's uh, and they're pretty expensive for executives. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to share some of the knowledge that we were creating and and some of the insights that we were uncovering 
um, in a more accessible way. And folks who are in India and Russia find it difficult to get to Palo Alto, especially during the pandemic. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to give folks a chance to uh, learn alongside us. We've been working on researching a book that, you know, who knows if it'll ever come out, but we wanted to share the learnings while they're still fresh and invigorating and exciting to us. Um, and so in a way, what started as a medium of expression has morphed into a movement where we've been amazed at the uh, level of interest and engagement with innovators and as Laura said, creative practitioners around the world. And we're thrilled to get to share not only some of our thinking, but spotlight other amazing creative practitioners thinking as well. So I am a, a big time history buff and book nerd. And um, there's lots of stories that I have that I've gleaned from who I consider to be creative masters, practitioners, whether it be in science or art or business or uh, in, in discovery, in invention, et cetera. But the series also hopefully will highlight and spotlight folks who are actively advancing their craft in many different domains here. And so uh, we're excited to especially have a series dedicated to educators because one of the things we discovered as we started this series is educators were coming out of the woodwork invigorated and engaged and asking questions and seeking to find ways to apply their learnings in their context. And we thought we're, we were probably just reaching a small sliver of the overall educator population, obviously, but in collaboration with Laura and Sam and the K-12 lab and other uh, networks as well, we wanna reach folks who are most passionate about bringing these tools to bear, not only in the lives of others, but in the lives of themselves. And so, uh, and so with that, what, what I wanna do is I wanna introduce you to the first session, which as I think you know, is all about um, what we call input obsession, or I might even introduce a different word a little bit later. Um, so welcome to session one. Um, and one thing I wanna say is we want this to be a community of practice. So we've actually created a WhatsApp group. If you want to join, you can just scan with your phone and you can actually join the WhatsApp group. Um, we've got WhatsApp group for the, uh, for the original series as well. And I've been amazed at the kinds of questions and interaction that have formed there. We had a, a, a pediatric surgeon at Boston Children's Hospital just yesterday text the group saying, hey, I'm trying to get it, to engage uh, nurses and staff who are overworked. What are some tools or tricks? And we had a really vibrant discussion around that. So the idea is WhatsApp groups Although, as we've seen recently, there can be challenges with that, they, off, they offer a really great way to establish a community of practice. So we want to share that here. The other thing I'll mention is some folks like to fast forward and kind of see the material in advance. You can download these slides today or at any time in the future at bit.ly slash Stanford M-O-C-E-E, -E, which is just Masters of Creativity Educators Edition. Number one, you can download the slides and basically hit fast forward on me and kind of do the TiVo whoop, 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 if you want. So that's fine. Um, but that being said, we started with these four original sessions, which were built on some of the research that my good friend and uh, collaborator, Barry Claybon and I had undertaken. We started with some of these original sessions and we, we, the, the program has since grown. Um, and what I wanna do is I wanna focus on this first topic. One of the things that we've observed is that masters of creativity, again, regardless of their domain, are what we call input obsessed. And there's this, uh, there's this mistaken belief that creativity is all about output. When folks think about creativity, all too often they think about some kind of a creative output. But what we'd say is that's, that misses the point. Creativity is actually something that happens, first of all, in your head before anything else. And if you think, I have a simple question that I would, uh, that I would offer to you. What is an idea? I was doing a guest lecture in a project uh, product management class in the engineering school yesterday. And this topic came up, what's an idea? And you realize, wow, when we think about creativity, we think about generating ideas, it's kind of challenging to describe what an idea is. And if you can't describe what an idea is, how are you gonna you know, get started? And what we'd say is uh, very simply stated, an idea is a new connection. As far as we understand the, uh, the neuroscience of it, the brain is incapable of creating new material from scratch. Can't be done. What does the brain do? It creates unexpected and new connections between two known things. So it's stacking Lego pieces in a new way. I gave the example of a trucking company I've been working with lately. Uh, one of the innovators inside of the company has the idea of 
you know, just like there's mid-air refueling for airlines, what if for electric cars that, are, that have autonomous driving, could there be a mid-flight refueling of the battery pack, right? That's pretty cool. Well, is that a new idea? It's actually formed of parts that are all familiar, and yet it's strikingly new, but it's this kind of Lego combination of things we hadn't considered before. As Arthur Kostler said, creativity is the collision of two apparently unrelated frames of reference. And so this notion of input obsession is basically acknowledging that creativity is actually a function of input. And we can think about creativity as having an input obsession or having a connection obsession. And input is something that, at least I'll speak for myself, I didn't attend to very well early in my practice. I'm an MBA and a financial professional by training. I'm more comfortable in Microsoft Excel than I am in Adobe Illustrator. I'd rather use pivot tables and do net present value calculations than try to you know, use Photoshop. Um, but my wife is a fashion designer. And one of the things I noticed is, you know, she works for, at the time she worked for a children's uh, clothing company. And she would take trips to Paris and New York. And as far as I knew, she's eating, you know, macarons and deep dish pizza, or sorry, New York, not deep dish, New York style pizza. Um, and, but she, she told me I had it all wrong. And she started explaining they're seeking inspiration. The whole team is seeking inspiration on colors and textures and textiles. And they've got to get in the field. They've got to get their hands dirty. <clears throat> I didn't really understand it. She'd make inspiration boards and things like that. And I thought a spreadsheet makes a lot more sense. But then I've since, as I started working at the D school and started teaching executives and grad students at the D school, I started to see the value of being deliberate about the kinds of inputs that were provoking my thinking. And uh, I found myself in, in a class last year teaching alongside a Grammy award-winning hip hop artist named Lecrae. And Lecrae and the team and I were giving our students an assignment around gathering inspiration. And as I looked at the students' faces, it was like looking in a mirror at my past self. All of their furrowed brows, these are doctors and lawyers and business people, and they're all looking at me like, inspiration? You know, and you know what they're thinking? You mean like one of those cheesy 1980s posters in the hallway that encouraged his teamwork or motivation? Or <clears throat> and I, I realized, oh, wow, they are where I was, right? And so I said, Lecrae, what do you think about inspiration? And you know what he said? He said four words that really struck me and I think helped the students understand what we were going for. He said, inspiration is a discipline. And to me, that's that, that, that statement is very powerful because it demonstrates the stark contrast. You know, we're inspired about our, or we're disciplined about our eating. We're disciplined about our exercise. We're disciplined around calling our family back home, whatever it may be, but we recognize it requires attention. Folks who are deliberate about their creative life are deliberate about inputs. And what we would say, how I would define inspiration, not as a cheesy 1980s poster, but I would say, it's the disciplined pursuit of unexpected inputs. And if you wanna be a creative practitioner in your context, and Laura has shared with me about how the role of a head of innovation in schools has changed over time and evolved over time. And I'd say, if you're going to be a successful leader of innovation, you have to be a master of creativity yourself. You might've thought this series was about learning from other masters of creative practice, which certainly it is, but it's also, I think by participating in this series, there's the implicit acknowledgement, I wanna grow in my creative craft too. I want to be more masterful in my ability to think creatively and solve problems in unexpected ways. And very simply, what we'd say is, if you want to be good at inspiration, you need to be mindful of the connections you're exposing your mind to, and then how you think about harvesting or synthesizing those connections. So input obsession is really all about connection obsession. And I wanna just mention a handful of tools we've been teaching in the executive education programs and in our leadership class at Stanford because they've been super helpful to students. Um, and then I, uh, so I'm gonna talk about that first and then I'm gonna talk about how do you create space for your brain to um, realize those new connections. So one is around seeking inputs, the other is around really harvesting inputs. 
And one of the first thing that's really powerful, if you think about having a disciplined pursuit of inputs, is leveraging analogies. Analogies are fantastically useful devices to spur fresh thinking. So we don't have to read through this. There's an excerpt from Range, which is a great book if you haven't read it. I know many of my educator friends and I kind of geek out when we talk about range, but there's a great, is a classic problem known as Dunker's radiation problem. And the basic gist is in the 1930s, psychologists introduced a difficult challenge around uh, radiation. A doctor uh, needs to eliminate a tumor. Uh, the rays have to be concentrated enough that they kill the tumor, but if they make it that concentration, it will kill healthy tissue as well. How do you solve the problem? And what's interesting is very, very few people could solve the problem, something like 10% of people. But when Dunker would introduce uh, analogies, something happened, right? He talked about a general who wanted to capture a fortress. You can read this later. You can read it in range if you want. I don't have to you know, go verbatim here. But basically, he introduced an analogy. And sometimes that would help people. And he would introduce another analogy. There's also an analogy of a of a fire chief who's trying to put out a fire. And if they do it in this way, it works. And what Dunker found, which is very interesting, is that about 10% of people were able to solve the insight problem on its own. If they uh, were exposed to analogies, about 30% of people could solve the problem. But if they were given analogies and told to use them, 80% of people could solve the problem. And here's the point. It's not just exposure to new information that matters, it's leveraging new information that matters. That's why we say leverage analogies. I wrote a little blog piece on this on my blog if you wanna dig into it a little bit more, but very simply, leveraging an analogy leads to more output than a generic prompt. That's the first realization. The second realization is leveraging multiple analogies leads to more output than leveraging a single analogy does. And then the third and most fascinating thing to me is leveraging the more distant the analogy, the more uh, divergent the output of that analogy is. We, we have a really rich example that we tell um, or that we experienced actually in some of our work with organizations when we interacted with Fairchild Semiconductor. And they were trying to solve a really intractable problem in their business where they were small and medium sized businesses weren't getting the kind of support they needed. And the executives of Fairchild didn't really understand how to deal with the problem. They, they were able to predict, you know, in the millions of units, but they couldn't really predict on the, you know, thousands of units because they were always off by one or 2%. That's fine for people ordering millions of units, but it's a really big problem if you're only ordering a few units. To have no granularity of your uh, shipping details or forecasts is, is a real challenge for small customers. And one of the things, one of the breakthrough moments for the Fairchild team is when we took them through this tool we call analogous exploration. And they went to a flower shop and they went to a hotel and they learned about how radically different businesses interact with their supply chain, create transparency, create information sharing. And it led to what Fairchild says is one of the first major innovations in the semiconductor industry in the last 50 years. And it's all because they were deliberate about seeking, not benchmarking, not what's another, you know, uh, semiconductor company doing, but a florist, a hotel, they went to a sushi bar. They thought radically about the problem they were trying to solve and, and, and who they might glean inspiration from. That's a pretty deliberative approach. The other tool that we wanted to mention is a tool that's a little bit less deliberative. We call it the wonder wander, but it's basically an, an acknowledgement that entertaining the possibility of relevance is an incredibly valuable tool. You can basically take any problem that you've got in your mind and go outside and walk around the block and ask yourself, what does that have to do with my problem? I see a, a playground. Huh, what, is, what can a playground tell me about my problem? I see a Amazon truck. How would Amazon solve this problem? I see a nail salon. How would a nail salon deal with this? And what, what am I doing? I'm trying on new combinations. It's actually really hard just to think of something random. You go, uh, I don't know, right? Pine pineapple, right? Which is okay. That's my random. I actually love pineapples, not random at all. But the point is we become constrained very quickly by our own, what we know. 
and forcing ourselves out into the world and forcing ourselves to consider the possibility of relevance a lot of times leads to unexpected breakthroughs. And what we tell students is we want you to leave your computer, actually leave it, set it aside, go out into the world and write down unique ideas that come to you as you think about connections. If a student thinks the challenge is to come up with an idea, they panic. Oh, it's got to be good. It's, it's got to be new. If you say your, your objective is to make unexpected connections, oh, that's, that's doable. I had one student, and I, I teach a class at the D school right now called Transformative Design. And one of our engineering students came up to me afterwards. He says, you have no idea how liberating it is to know that ideas are just connections. It's so liberating, right? And what we want to be doing is we want to be uh, lowering the bar, not only for our students, but also for ourselves so that we can get started. The other, the other thing that I want to mention by way of connection is um, collaboration is an incredibly powerful lever. It's so powerful. In fact, we started to make it a part of this talk, but it's such a rich topic that we're actually going to devote an entire other session to this notion of collaboration. We've leveraged examples as varied and diverse as from Charles Darwin to Benjamin Franklin to Pixar to Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works. There's tons of amazing examples of how to be deliberate about the kinds of collaborators and the way in which you engage them. Because if you think about it, the people you're working with are one of the primary inputs to your thinking. And if you're gonna be input obsessed, you ought to at least be considerate about the constellation of collaborators that you're engaging in your work. So that's gonna be another session. That's just like a teaser. I'm sorry, it's totally mean to just hint at it. There's amazing stories that I'm not gonna tell you right now. Okay, but last thing I'll say as it relates to connection is this idea that awareness, as I said earlier, awareness matters. There's some great research by a neuroscientist in uh, Denmark who found that being aware of the underlying neurological uh, happenings, basically realizing that your brain is making connections has profound impact on your ability to generate ideas. In their studies, they found that, it, that just understanding the neurology, they basically took two groups of people or three groups of people. One group, they didn't give them any creativity training. Another group, they gave creativity training. I saw, I'm just seeing a text message that says we broke WhatsApp. So we'll get another group going because this the first group already filled up. Who knew there was a limit? I love it. Um, so they gave one group um, no training whatsoever. They gave another group creativity training. They gave a third group creativity training plus training in the underlying neuroscience. You go, they're not going to be neurologists. What does that matter? And yet what they discovered was having an understanding of what's happening neurologically when you're trying to generate new ideas had a dramatic impact on the level of divergence and the level of output that folks were able to experience. So I just, I just mentioned that to say, helping people understand these things, inputs matter, making connections matter actually leads to, you might think it's beyond the scope of an introductory training. It, what we find is it's not, it's incredibly powerful. But then the question comes, okay, once I filled my brain with new things, I've been input obsessed, I've got new stuff in here, what do I do in order to realize those new connections? Because they aren't always automatic or instantaneous. And what we'd say here is, especially during the COVID era, especially on Zoom, we have found immense benefits to disconnection. And what we'd say is a creative life is characterized by two things, deliberate connection and deliberate disconnection. And I mentioned this second because it's a little bit more paradoxical. It's a little bit more unexpected. Connection, you go, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But what about disconnection? Disconnection is actually integral to your ability to synthesize and process and imagine. And in this all, and I mentioned the, the uh, pandemic era and Zoom because in the always on world, right? Raise your hand if you've got a meeting at the end of this call. Yeah, it's like basically, you know, 70% of people here. We all do, right? Well, when are you gonna think about this? Well, uh, later, right? Which is also never, by the way. And because we aren't deliberate about disconnection, we, we rob ourselves of the ability to synthesize and realize new connections. One of my favorite examples of this, uh, Amos Tursky, who's the longtime collaborator of Danny Kahneman. Kahneman won the Nobel Prize on their behalf. Tursky had sadly passed. 
Um, they are the fathers of modern behavioral psychology, along with B.F. Skinner. They basically they, they demonstrated through a bunch of radically invented experiments, uh, inventive experiments, that human beings aren't as rational as uh, conventional economic theory would suggest. And what's more deeply unsettling is they're irrational in predictable ways, in ways that you can actually hack, right? And so it's a fantastically interesting uh, set of outcomes, but they were derived from a fantastically insightful set of experiments. And someone at once asked Amos Tursky, how did you come up with so many interesting experiments? And you know what he said? He basically credited his long meandering walks with Danny Kahneman. We took a lot of walks. And here's what he said. You waste years by not being able to waste hours. He said, we wasted time. But because we wasted time, we were able to realize things and make connections that the people, they were, they were widely derided in their uh, department because they were laughing too much. I kid you not. One of the greatest criticisms of Amos Tursky and Danny Kahneman is they're having too much fun. That's not real work. Real research is boring and serious, right? And what they knew is actually, no, it's not true. We have to disconnect in order to make new connections. I wanna mention one very dorky aside um, as it pertains the psychology of creativity. And I don't wanna to go too far down this path because I, I'm like watching the numbers here. We're gonna start losing people if I go here for long, but just by way of very, very superficial introduction, the idea is how does a new idea get formulated? Here's one model. There are others. It's not, I'm not claiming it's the only one, but there's a period of preparation, period of incubation, a period of illumination or the aha moment, the eureka moment, and then verification. And what I would say is, especially in today's world and, you know, in my life, um, you know, myself included, present company included, incubation is a severely under-resourced area. We do not attend to giving things space to marinate. You know what I told the product management class yesterday, yesterday at Stanford? Don't solve the problem for a while. They've all just identified the problem that they need to be solving in this product management class. And they've got the midterms bearing down on them and they've got finals and they got their, their you know, the, the interview process. And there's all this pressure. And I said, just stop. Allow yourself time to marinate, to gestate, to consider. And I, I leverage some very interesting examples. It's a, it's a body, it's a class of activities that we affectionately refer to at the D School as divergent diversions. But you know what um, Albert Einstein did whenever he was stuck on a problem? There's a fascinating set of stories in uh, some of the biographies where they, both his son and his wife remember how when he was stuck on a problem and he wasn't making headway, he would pick up his violin and he, would, he loved Bach and he'd play a small concerto. And they would tell the story how many times the violin would clatter to the ground. He'd say, I've got it. And he'd start frantically writing again. To me, what's fascinating there is he wielded the violin knowing, you know what? This problem won't yield to direct effort I need to approach it indirectly. I need to create some space for my subconscious to consider this in a different way. Another great example, I don't know if you're familiar with the history of information theory. There's a gentleman named Claude Shannon. He wrote probably the most influential thesis paper ever written. He was a member of Bell Labs in their wildly inventive era. And he, he literally created information theory. The notion that information can be communicated with ones and zeros, which is the basis of this phone call and our screens and the modern world. That's his thesis paper as a college student, okay? Um, he was interested in uh, cryptography and things like that, and it led to understanding you can communicate more than just words with beeps. You can communicate colors and all sorts of things, fascinating stuff. His colleagues at Bell Labs often joked because when he was stuck, he would unicycle around the hallways and juggle. This is an actual picture. You can't make this stuff up. Will, can you make this stuff up? I'm just seeing, I'm seeing my friend Will here, right? Michael, can you make this stuff up? You can't, it's crazy, right? But what, what do I know? We know that wildly inventive thinkers create space to accommodate their subconscious and to incubate and to allow themselves to think. And so we've been giving the assignment at Stanford, go play. 
Stop working on the problem. Stop directly approaching it. It's not to say that it doesn't require hard work. Not at all. We must work hard. We must be focused. But then after we focus, do we move on or do we continue to allow our subconscious to keep chipping away at the problem? You can even go so far as to sleep on it. I know it sounds crazy. And yet the history of invention and discovery is littered with examples of midnight reverie and epiphanies. B.F. Skinner, who along with Kahneman and Tursky founded behavioral economics, he found his midnight uh, session so profoundly productive, he started setting an alarm at midnight. And for over 20 years of his time at Harvard, he set an alarm at midnight and alarm at 1 a.m. So that for that, and he had a clipboard and for one hour, he would record things that were coming to him in the middle of the night, okay? But a, a, a more playful and hysterical example, in my opinion, is of Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison had what he called his thinking chair. And when he was working on problems and he, and that were difficult or when he needed fresh ideas, he'd sit down in his thinking chair, he'd put a ball bearing in each hand, in each palm, and he'd put a pie pan underneath the arms of the chair. And he'd sit there until he fell asleep. And when he fell asleep, his hand would relax, the ball bearing would fall, it would wake him up, and he would have an assistant take dictation and write down whatever he was just thinking about. Okay, so, uh, th this, it, lest you think that that's just, you know, wacky, he does have more patents than anyone in American history. So something worked there. Salvador Dali did the same thing. He called it slumber with a key. And, and you think, wow, where do these mind bending paintings come from? Part of what Dali credits, he says a 30 minute nap is way too long. A 10 minute lap is infinitely too long. Even one minute is too much. He says, all you need to do is place a key between your fingers. And he used a plate and he would sit down. And as he fell asleep, the key would fall and he would awake. And he says, all it takes is an instant to revitalize your subconscious. But the point is this, we think sleep and we think um, not work, but Edison didn't call it his napping chair. He called it his thinking chair. He was able to acknowledge and appreciate that it's a different way of working. And if the only way of working is to be focused, to be at the computer, to be banging out email or spreadsheets or grading papers or whatever it happens to be, don't be surprised if you never have space to accommodate the problems that can't just be ticked off your list real quick. You actually have to be deliberate about creating space. And the last thing I'll mention, because we're all kind of perfectionist type A, you know, uh, high achieving individuals, is the value of procrastination. There's a great uh, example of this that Adam Grant gives in his uh, TED talk, but he basically makes the point. It's called the Zignarik effect. It's based on, based on some research from Russian psychologist Bluma Zignarik, who found that if a problem is considered done, you stop working on it. But if it's not considered done, you actually continue, your subconscious continues to work on it. So we give the assignment to students, procrastinate. It's just like I said yesterday, don't solve the problem yet. And the thing that's amazing, I actually put this note here just to remind myself, thank you self, I now remember to mention McKinnon. One of the most uh, influential studies of creativity was performed by a guy, Donald McKinnon, who was a, 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 a spy, kind of a he was a he lived a spy thriller life during world war ii and after the war after the spy games were over he became really obsessed with this question about what makes for productive creativity not that not that creativity is frivolous but there's all sorts of creativity and he really was focused on productive creativity i want to deliver practical valuable and novel contributions how do i do it and he undertook a study of architects and he asked all living or many of these living architects, who are the most inventive and creative professionals in your field? And then he did a study of those individuals and compared it to the rest. And he found two very interesting things. There are two ways in which uh, the, the most creative architects as defined by the remainder of the field differed from the rest. One was they were more apt to play, which is a whole talk in and of itself. The second is they tended to delay decisions much longer than their peers. They procrastinated. And what happens when they procrastinate? They open themselves up to receiving new information, to receiving new ideas. And so as long as you're, uh, as long as, the, the, the one caveat here I would say is you have to care about the outcome. If you're procrastinating on something you don't care about, you're not gonna yield anything interesting. 
But if you actually care, procrastination is just as a legitimate strategy as sleep is just as a legitimate strategy as the violin or as juggling, right? And it's really useful to see I can wield these tools as weapons in my creative arsenal or as tools in my creative toolkit. And to the, to the individual who's able to see that, it's very important. But here's the thing I would say, you have to have a discipline of documentation. I like to joke, you know, that the notebook is the butterfly net. It's how you capture the stuff that's coming in. And if you don't have a discipline of documentation, you won't be able to harvest all of the rich learnings that come out of your periods of disconnection. It's said that Beethoven took a walk every afternoon. He spent the morning composing. He would have a nice lunch and then we'd go on a walk, but he always brought an empty sheet of sheet music so that he could write down notes that came to him on the walk. Jeff Bezos, before he founded Amazon, you know, he was a hedge fund executive. He was a trader uh, in a hedge fund. And his colleagues recount how he was always frantically writing down ideas, quote, as if they would float off if he didn't write them down. So you see from Beethoven to Bezos, it's essential that we write down our ideas. And this is especially important. I want to mention it as it pertains to sleep, because the thing about sleep is it feels so good to keep yielding, but you have to have this disciplined willingness to interrupt sleep. And I'll give a very simple example from my own life just to illustrate the point. I don't like to be a hypocrite. So if I find myself teaching things that I don't do, it creates a real uh, sense of dissonance. And either I stop teaching it or I start doing it. And I noticed though with napping, I wasn't getting a lot out of my naps because I was just totally, you know, they, they turn into long sleeps or I'd wake up in the middle of the night and go back to sleep. And I thought to myself, I gotta start taking this seriously or stop talking about the value of sleep and the hypnagogic state to trigger insights, right? One or the other. So I said, okay, I put a pad of post-its by my bedside and I actually took off the back so that they stuck because you know otherwise you knock it off the table it doesn't work so I stuck it and tried to orient it to where I could reach and scrawl and the other night this just happened a couple weeks ago the other night I woke up in the middle of the night with a great idea and my first thought was oh man do I really want to try to write this down <laughs> but then my next, next thought was don't be a hypocrite. Okay. And then I kind of battled with it. I bet if I just think about it for a little while, I can remember it. Um, and then, and the, but, but I kind of kept pushing myself. And then finally I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to get up. I'm going to write it down. So I got up middle of the night. I wrote down the idea and then I went back to sleep. And the next morning, my first thought was, I knew I would remember the idea. That's so annoying. I wasted 10 minutes. I was going deep, but I could have been uh, I, I could have gotten this sleep because I totally remember the idea. And then I picked up the pad of post-its and realized it was a completely different idea than the one I woke up thinking about. And what's amazing is one, I actually had two good ideas out of sleep. And two, if I hadn't had the discipline and willingness to write it down, I would have missed the one that occurred to me in the middle of the night. And so it's important. And, and the last thing I'd say is this attitude is something that should, should, uh, should, should transcend any particular problem. When there's a particular problem, we may have a way, we have, may have tools that we bring to bear, but what we wanna advocate as part of the Masters of Creativity series is actually a different kind of lifestyle because right now what's popular in the world, what's in vogue is this notion of a sprint. And anytime there's a problem or a, a need for a fresh solution, we say, let's do a three-day hackathon. Let's do a two-day sprint. We're, and we're always on these short burst cycles. And I'd say that's great, but it's kind of like treating, coming up with ideas like going to the grocery store. We just need a couple of good ones, you know, just like pick up a gallon of milk on the way, pick up the, you know, bunch of kale. And what, what we want to advocate is actually, I mean, as useful and valuable as a sprint may be, definitely they're valuable. We also want to advocate an attitude of cultivation that you're actually thinking more like a garden than like a grocery store. Am I cultivating an environment where ideas are likely to unexpectedly sprout up? There may be delights, there may be disappointments, but it's this attitude of having this, this mindset of practice. I am going to engage with my creative muscle just like I engage my other muscles. You know, you would never say you're healthy because you ate a salad once. You have to kind of eat, you know, healthy regularly, right? You would never say you're hygienic because you took a bath a couple of weeks ago. You kind of have to keep taking baths, right? What constitutes a creative life? 
it's routine engagement of an important and complementary and sometimes counter cultural and paradoxical set of attitudes. And it's that routine engagement that's actually critically important. We believe that creativity is a craft that's honed through conscious practice. And we'll, we'll come back to this theme again and again and again in this series, that creativity is a craft honed through conscious practice. Um, and so we wanna invite you to join in that craft. Um, I want to open it up to I, I, my chat says 99 plus and it just goes away. So I'm not able to see the chat. So maybe I'll ask if Laura, if you see some questions, uh, yeah. that are interesting to you. maybe the last thing I'll say before we go to Q and a, um, or, you know, just discussion, by the way, I mean, let's, we can all discuss together is we would love for you to spread the word. We want other educators and other, uh, practitioners of design to be aware of this series. And one of the things we can do is if you scan this QR code, it pulls up a preloaded tweet. Change the text to whatever you want in the tweet. But if you share it with your network, we increase the likelihood that other folks who are interested in developing that sense of creative, not just confidence, but also competence are able to, uh, are able to grow in their practice as well. And what we've seen in the, uh, in the executive, executive education um, arena is that Folks keep adding friends and colleagues and collaborators and every session feels more and more like a family reunion where people are gathering and bringing colleagues and former coworkers, et cetera. So share this opportunity with your network because we'd love to um, be of service to as many innovators uh, in training as possible. So with that, Laura, um, yeah. is there a handful of stuff? I'll stop sharing. Yeah, I mean, I think, why don't we stop sharing? I think one thing that's coming up in the chat, which I think is really important, is like this multiple ways of knowing and being. One of the things that I think in K-12 particularly is that our young people show up and they're pausing all the time, whether it looks like their hand is on their desk. I've seen that. If anyone's seen that in their classroom, they're like, I'm done. I'm pausing. Right. I see Lisa. I know what that looks like is how are we as I think the, the big thing and Jeremy shared a lot of, you know, personal examples, um, some inspiration is like, how are we actually opening ourselves up? to the multiple ways in which we can practice divergent thinking and pausing. And I think one thing as educators, we all come from our own perspective, like this is what this looks like in my world. And I think our young people, right, are doing it in ways that we may not see. So how do we actually open our aperture to the multiple ways in which they're showing divergent thinking? Um, in the beginning of the chat, Jeremy, there was a key, which I thought was really helpful about wondering versus ideas, about how yeah. do we help our young people distinguish between what are you wondering about versus ideas, which feels, idea feels a lot of pressure versus a wondering is, and I think maybe one way in could be interesting just for everyone to do like a quick chatterfall is how are you giving yourself time to actually practice that pausing, that divergent thinking. I already saw a bunch of things in the chat. Chris was like, I do a, a field note, people put it on their phone. Someone in the chat, uh, Jeremy said, I practice my voice memos on my phone at night. I capture those. And That's if we great. are a community, one of the great things about community is harvesting and really sharing some of the best ideas from each other. So I am kind of curious is how do you all right now capture um, your ideas? Some people do it on running. I'm seeing that in the chat, Jeremy. Some people are saying showers are the best ideas. Some people are writing lots and lots of notebooks. Mike is like a road trip, playing music, dead shows. Ryan's got that on. He's listening to old music, dead shows. Lots of notebooks. I love it. I keep seeing it. And then the question I have to you all, and maybe Jeremy, as you think about classrooms and going back to questions, is how do we make space in our classroom for this? I think one of the tensions, and maybe Jeremy, you can speak a little bit about this in K-12, is there is an urgency for us to solve the pressing problem right now because we have such a responsibility to solve the challenges that are facing our young people. And yet when we actually take the time to pause, right, we actually come up with better ideas. And yeah. so as you think about the practices, I see writing and letting down, notebooks, and doodles, scrolling Twitter for me, great growth, and I do the same thing. Um, Maybe one way in right now is what are the practices that people are putting in their classrooms and their schools or what might they do to actually get this divergent and wondering as part of their rituals within classrooms? 
And maybe we can put those in the chat as what are you actually doing right now to inculcate this ritual of inputs that Jeremy just talked about is ways which you can actually bring in this space for wondering. And then maybe Jeremy, you can close this up and we can also have people kind of share some questions, but I see writing goals, I see doodles, I see free periods. Could I, one thing that I would just uh, recommend, and this is kind of a whole, this could be a whole other topic, um, but I think there's something incredibly powerful about the calendar. Um, and I think if, if we ask ourselves, why doesn't X behavior happen? Most of the time it's because I don't have time. Well, okay, granted, you don't have time now. What about you in November? Does you in November have time? And I don't know about you, or like you in December, or you in January, okay? Go look at the calendar for Jeremy in January. He's actually kind of less busy. Now, one way in which Jer Jeremy, you know, uh, October Jeremy can write January Jeremy a love note is by blocking his calendar for the things he wishes October Jeremy could do. And so to me, it's like there is like there, like the calendar is a true and legitimate constraint and it's it's a constraint right now. And, a, and one of the most invigorating things I've done is, is what I call writing a love letter to myself where I start to actually say, okay, I can't do it right now, but like, I wanna take, you know, one of the things that I've discovered, this, this is a little bit of an aside, but one of the things I've discovered in my research and writing and things like that is there's two, I have four daughters. There's not a lot of stories about women or I don't know a lot of stories about women. And the other thing is, there's not a lot of stories about black creators, not nearly as much as I want. So what do I have on my schedule? I have a, one time per week where I interview a female founder with a, with a woman friend of mine, a VC. And I have one time per week that I email or I interview a black creator with a black friend of mine, who's an amazing creator himself, right? And to me, I, what, what I see, I give that as an example to say, I've used my calendar as a weapon. And sometimes like I see next Friday, I don't know who Marcus and I are talking to yet, but it's not like Thursday, you know, next Thursday, I'm going to go, oh, I don't have time for that. No, every Friday at 11 is blocked for what is an incredibly meaningful and valuable um, discussion that I want to prioritize, even if I don't know the details of it yet. So it's just an example of using, but for me, when I, real, when I came to that realization, it took me a month before I could block that time. It wasn't something that could happen next Friday. It's like, okay, but it's, it's tempting to think if it can't happen next Friday, I can't do it. And, what, and, and one simple trick I've come up with is look a month out. Can I do it then? Okay, great. Write my, write my future self a love note and determine I'm going to do it then. The thing that I wish I could do now, but keep saying I don't have time to do. That's great. And we're getting ideas in the chat, Rebel Girls. And I think that also lends a question that I have for all of us is, as, again, as educators, is like, what are we not seeing? Who are we not listening to? You know, we all tend to live in our, with our own communities and we kind of see beyond. And I think our job in K-12, right, is to always notice who's not being met yet, whose stories need to be heard. Thank you, Nicodermis. Good to see you. Um, centering the voices of our BIPOC and like trans and female designers. Like what are those are the stories that need to come up? right, within our communities, that we need to have more of those. And our jobs as masters of creativity, right, and using that term, as, as Jeremy loosely said, we're all practicing, is That's to right. not just get a better, the ritual. Yeah, is actually to see how they're showing up. And I think as a K-12 person myself, is like, my job is not just to predict it, right, but to actually amplify when I see it happening in schools and giving my young people the opportunities to practice that. When, when they are doing it, right? So that they know that there are multiple ways of being and knowing, taking the pluralistic view of creativity, right? This idea that creativity does not exist in a vacuum. It's not owned by one, one group of people. It is, a, it is everyone has the capacity to be creative. So we think when we think about masters of creativity, we are all together, but our young people are actually mastering it right now. And how are we actually opening the aperture to see that? How are they doing it right now in their daily practice? in your classrooms and in your communities right now that we need to get better at seeing, that we need to get better at noticing and wondering and, and actually creating rituals for them so they can show up in that space. So they know that this is how to do it for themselves. As I think Liz Perry put it in there is that we all have our own way of doing this. And I think as educators, our job is not only to know our own way, but then to amplify the multiple ways in which this can happen in communities. Mm -hmm because we need all of us to solve these problems. And that is our job as educators to amplify the voices that need to be heard, as well as find new ways to practice it for ourselves and with others.